Hi guys, sorry for the delay. It is me, Carrie, and I am back with the second part of Dicey's Song, which is the sequel to Homecoming. It's part of the Tillerman series of books by Cynthia Voigt. I really, really, really hope I'm picking up where I left off last time because this is a fairly long chapter. I may even have to go into three sections, we'll see. But I'm pretty sure I know where I left off. If I am repetitive at all, I do apologize. But, um, yeah, I think this is where I was when I left off last time. So, anyway, Dicey had decided to ask Millie Tidings, who owns a little grocery store down by the water at the foot of the one main street, if she had a job open. The store wasn't ever busy, at least not ever when Dicey was in there. She wondered if anybody besides Graham shopped there, and she couldn't blame them. Millie didn't keep the windows or floors particularly clean. Dust gathered on the cans and boxes on unwashed shelves. The meat and fish counter, behind which Millie worked most of the time, got wiped down every day. Dicey guessed from the way the white enamel gleamed. Millie might be lazy, she might just be too tired, and Dicey guessed if she had to tote that body around every day all day long, she'd get tired too. Or she might just not care. Whatever the reason, Dicey figured there was a lot of work she could do in Millie's store. Dicey leaned her bike up against the grimy plate glass window and entered the dim little store. Millie was at the back, leaning against the top of the meat counter. "'What can I do for you today?' she asked. "'Your grandmother forget something?' Her little blue eyes rested lazily on Dicey. She had gray hair that she had braided into circles around her head. "'No,' Dicey answered. "'I came to ask if you might give me a job.' "'A job? Why? Why should I do that? "'I don't make enough to keep myself in comfortable shoes,' Millie told her. "'But if I kept the place clean or more people would want to come and shop,' Dicey argued." If I washed the windows and the floors and dusted off the shelves and the cans and the boxes? My Herbie used to do that, Millie said, before he died. Business isn't good, she told Dicey. Dicey made herself be patient. She'd just been talking about that and how to make it better. But it should be, she argued. She'd thought about this all the long bike ride into town. I mean, you have the only grocery store right downtown, the only store people can walk to. The supermarkets are way out on the edge of town and people have to drive there. It would be more convenient for people to come to you. If your store looked nicer, they would want to. Millie seemed to be thinking about this. Business used to be better, she finally said. Dicey stared at the woman, at the heavy mottled flesh of her face. She thought maybe Millie wasn't very smart at all. She'd never thought of that before. If that was the case, how would she go about convincing Millie to give her a job? I think business could be better if the store looked better, she said. Millie's eyes moved slowly around, studying the narrow aisles. It's dirty, she said, but not back here, she added. I've always passed the health department inspection. You're a good butcher, Dicey said, trying a little flattery. Graham says so. Really? Millie smiled at this. Did she really? Dicey nodded. It was the truth. Ab always was smart and quick. You know, we all, all of us in school, hankered after John Tillerman. He was so handsome and dignified, you know? Dicey nodded, even though she didn't know. But it was Ab he courted. There were some tears shed over that, I can tell you. Millie nodded her big head wisely. Dicey didn't know how to get the conversation back on the track she wanted. Graham says your husband taught you how to be a butcher. When we got married, that's right. I wasn't so fat then, she said. We never did have any children. She relapsed into silence. If I worked here, Dicey said finally, there's lots I could do. Aren't you supposed to be in school? I mean, maybe after school for an hour, maybe Saturdays in the mornings. That wouldn't be very long, so it wouldn't cost me very much. I'd like the company, Millie said. How much were you thinking of me paying? A dollar an hour, Dicey said. She was underage, so she couldn't charge much. Millie thought about this, her fat sausage, sausage shaped fingers working on the countertop. I thought if I worked four days a week after school and then three hours on Saturday, Dicey said. The fingers moved. That would be seven dollars a week, Millie announced. Dicey nodded. She figured with seven dollars, she could give each of the little kids an allowance of a dollar a week and the rest to Graham. Except, now she changed her plan. She'd give herself an allowance, too. They'd never had allowances. Mom never had any extra money at all to be able to count on to give them. So when they wanted paper or pencils for school or shoelaces, they had to ask her, and her face got all worried until she figured out where to find the extra money. I don't know, Millie said. We could try it, Dicey offered. I could work for three weeks on trial. Then if your business wasn't getting better, you could fire me. I've never fired anybody. I don't know how, Millie objected. You see, Dicey spoke urgently. My theory is that your business will get better. So instead of costing you money, I'll be making you money. Do you think so, Millie asked? Dicey bit her lip and nodded. 
This was like talking to a bowl of jello. Everything you said slipped in and jiggled the jello, but it didn't make any dents. So you think it might work out that way? Dicey nodded, like a bowl of strawberry jello, her least favorite kind. Then maybe I should. I'll start on Monday, Dicey said quickly. I'll come in after school on Monday, so I'll be about 3.15 I'll be here. All right, Millie said. Dicey left before the woman could change her mind. Maybe it would work, maybe it wouldn't, but her guess was that it would. In any case, she had the next three weeks taken care of. She was satisfied, she thought, riding, her, riding seven miles back over flat, curving roads to her grandmother's house. To our house, she corrected herself. When she said our house, she couldn't help thinking about the cabin in Provincetown up against the windy dunes, even though she knew that wasn't their house anymore. At dinner, she told everyone about her job. She looked mostly at Graham while she was telling and thought the woman approved. But aren't you underage, Graham asked her. Yes, but Millie didn't seem to mind. She didn't even ask, Dicey said. That's because she's never had a thought in her head that somebody else didn't put there for her, Grandma said. Graham said, excuse me. You mean she's stupid? Sammy asked. He shoveled spaghetti into his mouth in long strands because he was too hungry to practice winding it on a fork. He had spaghetti sauce all over his face. You might say that, Graham said. What about school? She asked Dicey. School's easy, Dicey told her. I won't have any trouble in school. At least she wouldn't have any trouble passing, unless it got so bad in the stupid home ec course they made her sign up for that she started cutting classes. I thought, she looked at Jane's admiring face and Sammy's spaghetti decorated one and Maybeth's quiet one, we should have allowances, a dollar a week, she announced, pleased with herself. Even me, Sammy demanded. Even you, Dicey agreed. Good o, Sammy said. Even Graham? Dicey met her grandmother's eyes. She couldn't tell from the expressionless face whether Graham was amused or angry or insulted. Graham, too, but Graham gets more. It's only seven dollars a week altogether, she apologized. That would be only three dollars a week. And if her business doesn't get better after three weeks, I'll have to find something else. You could get some shoes, Tim, Sammy told his grandmother. You need to wear shoes when the weather gets cold out. Graham's expression resolved itself into amusement. Well, you do, Sammy pressed on. Graham always wore bare feet unless she was going into town. Bare feet and a long skirt with a blouse loose over it. She wore her clothes for comfort, she told the children. I have shoes I wear in cold weather, she told Sammy. How do you think I lived so long? Not by going barefoot in cold weather. I didn't know that, Sammy complained. How could I know? I thought it was a good idea. It was, Dicey assured him. So it's all right, she asked her grandmother. If you've made the arrangements, it'll have to be, Graham said. But I always thought, if you were family, you talked over your plans first. And got permission, James reminded Dicey. Not permission, Graham said, just to check in. Dicey bit back anger. She thought, she said to herself, she was doing something pretty smart and to help out, too. Nobody said thank you or anything. I'm proud of Dicey, Maybeth said softly. Oh, so am I, Graham said. I think Dicey knows that. You get things done, girl. I've got to give you that. So do I, Sammy said. It's what Tillermans do, Dicey said, feeling better. And I had something to talk over, too, Graham told them. I've got an appointment downtown next week. About getting welfare money, she said as if the words tasted bitter. Then she added, I thought I might as well talk to a lawyer and get advice and ask about adoption, if that's what you want. But what about Mama? Sammy asked. Mama's sick, you know that, Dicey said quickly. She can't take care of us. She might get better and she might not. The doctors think she won't, James added. Sammy had stopped eating. Because she's crazy sick, he asked. Dicey nodded. But how does she eat, he demanded. If she doesn't eat, she'll die. Dicey looked helplessly at her grandmother. They have ways of feeding people with tubes and special liquids, Graham said. You could see Sammy thinking about this. But if you adopted us and Mama came back, he said to Graham, then we would put you and James into one bedroom and your Mama would sleep where you're sleeping, Graham answered quickly, because that was her room when she lived at home. Dacey could have gotten up and hugged her grandmother, except that they never did that kind of thing, the Tillemans, hugging and kissing. Or, Graham said, we might turn the dining room into a bedroom. We never use it, and she would have more privacy. Graham waited a minute for more questions, then nodded briskly. That's all taken care of, then, she said. If you wanted to adopt us, Dicey said, I'd like that. And me, Maybeth said. The boys, too, agreed. It would be safer for us, James explained. We'd have legal status and rights. But what about you, he asked his grandmother. Might be safer for me, too, Graham said sharply. James looked at her with sudden intensity, as if he wondered what she was thinking, and suspected it might be very interesting. But he didn't say anything. 
Dicey and Maybeth washed up the dishes. Dicey hurried through them, and Maybeth lingered, humming. It was Mama's song about giving her love a cherry without any stone, and Dicey joined in. She was drying the forks and putting them away while Maybeth scrubbed down the wooden table. How can there be a baby with no crying, they sang. All of a sudden, Dicey remembered how the words to the last verse answered that question and the other impossible questions the song asked. That's funny, she said. What is? The song. You just look at things another way and it all makes sense. When a chicken's an egg, it doesn't have bones. Isn't that funny? I think it's sad, Maybeth said. Anyway, the music is. Mama sang it sad. Dicey didn't know what to say, so she started the last verse. They worked at fractions. Maybeth's class had done them last year in second grade. Mrs. Jackson had told Maybeth she should understand fractions from one-half to one-eighth. Dicey figured that would be pretty simple. She took an apple and a knife and cut the apple in half. Then she cut it into quarters, then half the quarters. Maybeth watched with big eyes. When Dicey wrote down the fractions and showed Maybeth the numbers one-fourth and one-eighth and asked her which was bigger, Maybeth pointed to one-eighth. Dicey tried to explain, that one up there doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's called the numerator, and it tells you how many of the eight parts there are. I know, Maybeth said, studying the numbers seriously. Since the one is the same, the fraction with eight is bigger. Dicey showed her on the apple pieces, but since she had to combine two of the eighths to make a quarter, Maybeth now said that the two was bigger than the one. Dicey tried another approach. In fractions, the bigger the number in the denominator, that's at the bottom, the smaller the fraction is. But how can that be, Maybeth wondered, because you're talking about parts, not the whole number. It's different from the whole numbers. Dicey felt frustrated. It was so clear in her own mind, and Maybeth just sat and looked at her, or at the apple pieces, or at the paper. Her eyes got bigger. I don't understand, she whispered. Dicey didn't know what to do. That's okay, she said. They aren't important. I'm supposed to know them, Maybeth said. We'll try again, Dicey said, some other time. I'm going to eat, to eat an eighth, she announced, popping the crisp apple slice into her mouth. She had done it wrong, and she didn't know how to do it right. She tried not to look as discouraged as she felt. Maybeth smiled at her, and I'm eating a half, she said, eating another eighth, one that had been set beside its equal to make a quarter. The rest of the family was in the living room. They had opened the windows to catch any suggestion of a breeze. Outside, the sun was setting and splashing the sky with colors. Maybeth went right to the battered upright piano and picked out the tune she had been singing in the kitchen. She searched for notes that harmonized with the melody lines. Dicey watched her for a while, trying to figure out how to explain about fractions. Maybeth's back was straight, her face was serious, as she watched her fingers on the piano keys. After a while, she tried to add more harmony with notes played by her left hand. Graham and Sammy sat playing checkers, both of them barefooted, both concentrating on the board. They sneaked looks at one another's faces, as if trying to see what the opponent was thinking of for his next move. When Sammy was doing something tricky, it showed on his face. His eyes danced while he waited for his grandmother to fall into his trap, as if he could barely keep his cleverness inside. Graham gave herself away by her mouth, Dicey decided, because it would get all stiff and straight. That way you could tell she was hiding something, and all you had to do was look at the board to figure out what her scheme was. Dicey thought she'd like to play a game of checkers with Graham. She thought she could probably beat her. King me, Sammy ordered. Graham pointed out that he was still one move from the end of the board. Mama used to, Sammy argued. He was losing the game. His voice quivered. If you're going to play with me, you're going to play by the rules, Graham said. You're big enough, aren't you, to play by the real rules? Sammy didn't want to say yes, and he didn't want to say no. When he saw the way Graham looked across at him, he didn't say anything. Dicey went to stand behind James, who sat at the big wooden desk reading a thick book. He looked up over his shoulder at her and marked his place on the small print with a finger. How long do you think it'll take to get the boat fixed up, Dicey asked him. Not now, Dicey. I'm reading. What are you reading? The Bible. Why? James sighed. Mr. Thomas said every educated man should. He said it's one of the underpinnings of Western civilization. His face lit up. Isn't that an idea? Underpinnings of civilization? As if civilization was a big building, you know? Besides, there are some good stories in the Bible. And besides, Graham added in, it was the fattest book on the shelves, and James always likes to read the fattest ones. That's not true, James said. Isn't it? Graham answered. And besides, James said, if you have a big idea, you have to write it down in a big book. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to explain all the complicated parts. Didn't say there was anything wrong with what you were doing, Graham remarked. The piano played behind them played on softly through all this, as if Maybeth knew that everything was all right in the room. 
And look at this, Dicey, James said quietly. He turned the heavy pages back to the beginning. There was a long list of names and dates in different handwritings. Some of the ink was so old it had turned brown. The list went all the way down one page and part way down the next. James's finger pointed to an entry on the second page. John Tillerman, M.D. Abigail, 1936, she read. Then there were three names in a row in the same handwriting with dates of birth beside them. John Tillerman, Elizabeth Tillerman, Samuel Tillerman. By Samuel, there were two dates, and the last date had been put in later by a different hand. The same hand that put in a date of death for the first John Tillerman. Daisy touched Mama's name there in the ink and pointed at Samuel's name. That's Bullet, our uncle. He was only 19, James pointed out. They were talking almost in a whisper. It was a war, Dicey explained. Even so, James said, that's still young. He was only six years older than you, only nine years older than me. We should be written down too, Dicey thought, but maybe Graham didn't want that. I can hear what you're thinking, girl, her grandmother said. Dicey looked up alarmed. And you're right. Graham said. She got up, took James's place at the desk, and pulled an old fountain pen, pen out of the drawer. Slowly, she wrote down their names. Dicey Tillerman, James Tillerman, Maybeth Tillerman, Samuel Tillerman. They all looked at the names there. At last, Graham said, that's settled too. She gave James back his seat. None of the children said anything. Dicey guessed that, like her, they couldn't think of how to say all the things they were thinking. Finally, Sammy found words. Good o, he declared. Graham smiled to herself and agreed to play another game of checkers with him. James went back to his reading, Maybeth back to the piano. For a while, Dicey watched them all. Then she wandered out of the room. She had nothing to do. Their homework she had finished quite quickly after school on Friday. Just some math and memorizing for science. There weren't any chores she could think of. She decided to go outside. All right, guys, I am going to pause here because these are definitely longer chapters. And I want to try to keep these reading segments a little bit shorter because I have a feeling some people lose their attention span <laughs> if it's longer than like 20 minutes. So we will finish chapter one very soon. I can't promise tomorrow, but definitely within the next couple of days. So if you like this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up. You never have to, but it's always nice when you do. Feel free to hit the subscribe button if you're not subscribed to the channel already and you'd like to be, and hit the bell icon for notifications of any and all future uploads. Have an awesome rest of your day, guys, and I'll be back soon with more stuff. Bye.